Morning, church. Um, Our scripture reading is from John 17, from verse 6. I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I come from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. If we uh, have not met before, my name is Reino. It's on my laser cut name tag. Love wearing this. I always uh, make the mistake of still having it on after church service. So I've walked into Spar and people have gone, hey, Reino. And I go, hey, Busi, good to meet you. Like, how do people know who I am? I've also worn this in our complex. That's very awkward, right? Because you <laughs> knock up to your, uh, you rock up to your neighbor who you've known very, very long and then you wear your name tag. But uh, I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor, and I also have the privilege of opening up God's Word with you this morning. Thank you, Kuliso, for hosting as well. I feel really welcome. Thank you, Sanmarie, for leading us in worship. There's something about repetition in worship that makes me believe what I sing even more. I don't know if you guys had that feeling this morning, but the more we say the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they're safe, I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> Let's sing it again. So thank you. I appreciate the way you led us. Thank you, Erika, for reading the scriptures for us. Um, I'm excited to, um, well, and Tandiwe, who's not here now, who did the memory verse for us. We also polished up our memory verse last night. It's really cool to look at Bethany on our TV screen, YouTube, airplay to the TV screen, and see the kids walk through the memory verse. Uh, It's great for them, and it's great for us. Last week, I shared that I hold the conviction that we struggle with prayerlessness at the moment, and we struggle both individually and corporately. And I said I have that conviction because I see that when we have an immediate need or crisis, we pray like we've never prayed before. But then that urgency somehow fades to pray individually and when we are together, when things return to normal. And last week I asked you the question, what would happen if we do that to our breathing? What would happen if we say, oh, now we need to breathe like we've never breathed before? It doesn't make sense to think about breathing like that because breathing gives life. It shouldn't be like that with prayer. I said last week that prayer should permeate our lives, our beings, individually and corporately. And then I asked the question, did you know that praying to the Christian is like breathing? And it's like breathing to the church as well. 
Now, as we head towards our birthday, we'll be looking back and saying thank you. We'll be looking forward and also submitting ourselves to what God has for us in this next season. And as we head towards our birthday, Lissachor and I felt that the Spirit placed this on our hearts and that we should spend four weeks on the topic of prayer. The series is called Breathe. And in the series, we are studying how and what Jesus prayed. And in this prayer, John 17, we hear Jesus praying for us, and we hear clearly what the concerns and prayers of Jesus is for us and for the world. And we should ask ourselves the question as we work through the text today, do we pray like this? Are our hearts aligned with the heart of Jesus? Because we'll see Jesus' heart in this prayer. Question is, are our hearts aligned with Him? Last week, we spoke about praying to glorify the Son. We spoke about praying as an experience of eternal life. And we also spoke about praying to faithfully finish the work that is given to us. Now, this week, we will look at the part of John 17, which is a prayer for the disciples. And this prayer consists of three parts. I'm going to show them to you, and then we're going to walk through it. So the three parts are, there's a reason for the prayer, verses 6 to 11a. 11a just means the beginning of verse 11, or the first part. Then there's a prayer for protection, which is in verses 11b to 16. And then there's also a prayer for sanctification, which is a really big church word that I'll explain in verses 17 to 19. There you go. So the summary is also our theme, prayer for the disciples, and those will be our three points. Are you cool with that? Okay. Before we jump in, let me pray. Lord Jesus, this is the second time now that we've read this portion of Scripture together as your disciples. And we ask of you this morning that you would show us what we need to learn and what we need to hear and how we need to respond. I want to ask you that your word would be life-giving to us this morning that it would have us stand in awe of you and of your heart for us and for the world. I pray that we would be willing to submit ourselves under your word today. And I pray that we would not have any distractions or lies in our hearts or minds from the evil one as we are together as your children waiting to hear from you. I pray for myself that my words would be anointed. I pray for the hearts of everyone hearing us now and maybe even later that you would prepare our hearts to be receptive to your word. We love the fact that we have a Bible. We love the fact that we can open it up and speak freely about it in a uh, place like we are this morning. Speak to us, Lord Jesus. Your disciples are listening. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, let's look at the first one. The reason for the prayer. I'm going to put it on the screen. And as always, bold and underline is my own edits. It's just to focus your eyes on some really important words in this portion of Scripture. Remember that Jesus is now praying after a well-known portion of Scripture called the Farewell Discourse. So Jesus had a meal with His disciples. It was a, probably a six-and-a-half-hour meal in which they ate and chatted and ate and chatted and reclined. And then Jesus finishes off this massive meal with this longest recorded prayer of His in the Bible. Okay? Last week we read all 26 verses. And then we focused in on the first five. Today is another big portion. And in the weeks to follow, the portions do get a little bit smaller. Okay? So this is Jesus praying. Now look at the the emphases that I've placed. You gave them, they have obeyed. I gave them, they accepted. And they believed. There are three subjects in this portion of Scripture. And all three of them are involved, and all three of them are active. Do you see that? So God is doing something in this portion of Scripture. Jesus is doing something in this portion of Scripture, and His disciples, those who He prays for, I pray for them, I gave them, that's His disciples sitting around the table at that point, and I also think that it could include all other disciples that followed Jesus during His earthly ministry. So God has something to do with them, Jesus did something with them, and they did something in return. Do you guys see that? 
And the reason why Jesus is praying for them is because they matter. They are of great value. God is concerned with them. Can you guys see that in the Scriptures? God is not far off and away. Jesus is not apathetic to them, and they're not disconnected to Him. There's relationship flowing between these three parties. And the reason why the relationship flows between these three parties is because the people who Jesus prays for are of great value. Let me show you a picture as an illustration. There you go. Bars of gold. Every single person in this room knows that that has got great value. Why? Because it's a commodity. Why? Because enough people around the world think that it's valuable that it became a commodity after it was mined, and now people trade in it. None of us can say that is worthless. All of us would gaze at that picture and go, that's a lot of dollars right there. Per fine ounce. Do you guys remember when people read the news, they say that gold currently trades at per fine ounce. And I always thought as a kid, what, how, much, how much is a fine ounce? But anyhow, I won't digress there. Gold has got value. Human beings too. I want to challenge you. Look into someone's eyes long and deep enough and you'll see their value. Not a single human being on this earth can look into someone's eyes and really look and not see the value they have. God made us that way. We were created in His image. He made us to look and be like Him. We carry great value. And that is why Jesus prays for His disciples. Because they are important to Him. And let me just submit this to you. I think that should be enough reason to pray for anyone. <laughs> because they matter. And they are important to God. I thought about that as I was prepping the sermon. Often people would say, pray for me. And my response would be, what would you like me to pray for? And when I read this scripture, I thought to myself, I should actually just respond and say, okay. And pray for you because you matter. Because you carry great value. Because you are uh, created in God's image. And He gave and gave and showed and gave and protected you. That's why Jesus prays. Actually, if you look at it, if we can just go back to the scripture, Rudolf, and these three subjects all being active and involved, we actually see a beautiful description of the gospel. Look at it. There's a gift. There's a grip. And there's a leap of faith. That's how the gospel works. right? God gives grace and salvation and love and forgiveness and mercy and open arms welcoming you. But you have to grab it. You have to take it. I think I've used this illustration before, but I can say to Kuliso, listen mate, here's my iPhone. It is mine, but I am now giving it to you. As a gift. He won't receive it unless he gets up and grabs it. Takes a grip on it. And he won't get up and take a grip on it if he doesn't believe that I gave it to him as a gift. That's the reason why he hasn't gotten up yet. Because he doesn't believe that I gave it to him as a gift. Because it isn't your gift. It's just an illustration. Do you know what I mean? But if it was a real gift, you would have gotten up and got it. That's how the gospel works. So there's a gift from God, there's a grip from you, and that grip happens by taking a leap of faith. Look at the, um, ex uh, uh, um, the emphasis just on the previous slide, please, Rudolf. They believed that you sent me. That's good news for us today. Listen to it. You matter to God. You carry great value. You were created in His image. And He wants to be in an intimate relationship with you. We read that last week. And this is everlasting life that they would know the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. 
God wants to be in an intimate relationship with us, and that's why He created a way for us to be reconciled to Him. And the way that He created that way was by sending His Son, and then showing His love, and then giving the forgiveness that we needed through His Son, so that we can be reconciled with one another. That is always good news, and it's good news for you today. Even though you might be a seasoned saint, listen to it again. That's the good news to us. And that's why Jesus prays for us. Okay. So the first part, 6 to 11a, is the reason for the prayer. Let's, let's look at the second one. A prayer for protection. So the latter half, of verse 11 to verse 16. Why does Jesus pray for their protection? Well, because they have to stay. He says he's going. But they're staying. And it is dangerous here. So I'm going to pray, Father, look at it, Holy Father, that you would protect them. And we get two reasons, two so that's. Okay, so we'll get there now. The first so that says, so that they may be one. Okay, now think about this. Father, they are staying. And this place will make them fight with one another. Because this place is corrupt and full of sin, and selfish, and it promotes your own selfish interests. Protect them from it. Help them not to fight with one another. Help them to be one. And not one like, hey dude, <whistles> elbow greeting or high five. One like the Trinity, like the Father and the Son and the Spirit. That's really tight, guys. It's difficult to explain how tight it is, but it is really, really tight. Tight, that is Jesus' reference for unity, is the Trinity. And He's praying so that we will be one as they are one. Just think for a second, well not for a second, for a moment. How do Christians talk about Christians? Both in the church and in the public space. How do churches talk about other churches? Not only inside the church, but also outside the church. May I remind you that Jesus' own disciples, those 12 boys between age 12 and 15, also argued with one another. Why? Because of who's the greatest. I mean, we did it on the playground. Hey dude, show me your bicep. My bicep is bigger than yours. The disciples also did it. And then Jesus went, enough. There's division amongst you. Because you're arguing with one another. And I'm now going to protect you from it. And teach you how not to do it. I'm going to bend down. And I'm going to wash feet. So that you can see what it's like to be one of my disciples. There's no arguing amongst you. You should be one. And that's uh, the first part of our prayer for protection. This shouldn't happen. But it does. And what Jesus is praying for for His disciples is for a unity that is more than we just pitch for the same worship service on a Sunday. It's a unity that can be described as a spiritual and a relational unity. One of heart and mind. It's glorious when you have that kind of unity with someone. Think about it. Do you have someone in your life with who you have these experiences of, who we are really solid at the moment. Our hearts and our minds are aligned. This will bring the Father great joy if His kids are in unity with one another and they don't tear each other up over Twitter or WhatsApp messages or speak poorly of one another when they meet other people for coffee. It shouldn't happen amongst God's kids. We've got two, well, two kids, Ava and Katie, seven and five. And let me tell you as a dad, there are moments, I mean they're few and far between, but they are there, when my kids are in perfect unity with one another. Oh, it's so beautiful to be old. Like I pause, and then I feel like I want to cry and laugh, and then I just hug Marie, and I say to her, God's grace is huge. Look, look how beautiful they are playing together. No struggle, no strife, no arguing. 
Sissy, will you please do my hair now? Yeah, sure, Sissy, I'll do that for you. Turn towards me, boom, boom, brushing out there. It's the most beautiful picture in Thitty Blue Crane where we live. Now, guys and ladies, if that is good for my heart as a dad, can you imagine what the father wants to feel like if his children are in unity with one another? And can you also just think for a second how torn the father's heart must feel if his churches and his kids are all at odds with one another. Pointing fingers and calling each other's names and saying they are too much of that or too little of this. We can't work like that as a church. We should pray for it so that we can be one. I spent way too much time on this point, but I feel like it was really important. Okay, let's keep going. It's so important that I'm going to preach a whole sermon about it next week. Because in verse 20, Jesus picks up that same theme again of unity amongst his children. In verse 12, uh, Jesus says, I protected them while I was with them. Why? Because the evil one came for them. He calls uh, Satan the evil one in verse 15. And actually the evil one got one. And who was that? Well, that was Judas Iscariot that decided to believe the lie of the enemy and turned his back on Jesus. And then in verse 13, we see Jesus inserting another portion of teaching into his prayer. Do you guys remember? Verse 3 of chapter 17 was also a little teaching while Jesus was praying. And he does that again in verse 13. And he says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. That is a really, really important emphasis. Jesus says, I say these things, these things that I'm praying for, uh, so that they may have the full measure of joy. Joy, guys. His joy. Not a joy of this world. His joy. That's where question of the day came from. Now, I just want to ask you a question. Real talk. Is your life of faith a source of of joy for you. Because it should be. It's really important. If your life of faith is a burden to you, if your life of faith is something that you are negative and stressed about, then you need to hear the good news again. Because our lives of faith should be a source of joy for us. That is God's heart for us, as shown through Jesus Christ, that we may have the full measure of joy. Let me show you a picture. This is a picture of our two girls playing at a tidal pool in Port Shepston. Okay? So, Katie, closest to us. Ava, bent down just uh, uh, behind her. So here's the setting. There's a tidal pool where they cannot get hurt, where they are safe, and where they are protected. And Marie and I are sat from this vantage point, we are close to them, and they can go for gold. Like, nothing can go wrong there, because they're protected. And we are there. And then they play until the sun sets. Can you guys see the sunset there? Right? This is on the east coast of South Africa. So, uh, I mean, this was after many, many rounds of girls. Listen, we really need to pack up now. We really need to go. Like, I've taken down the umbrella. I've already folded the picnic blanket. I've put the stuff in the car at the parking lot. I've had a conversation with the car guard. Like, I've really done my part. And I go, come girls, come girls. And then they go, Papa, that is so lucky. We're having so much fun. We have so much joy. And then I go, but girls, you should be cold by now. And they go, Dad, we are, but it's so awesome. We don't want to leave. That's what God wants for you. Is that you would experience joy. And not be worried about this. Because you see, there it's really dangerous. They are going to die there. That ocean cares nothing about them. But we do. And if they are not protected by us, they will be left to the, 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 the spirit of the ocean and they surely will not make it. Because the ocean does not care about them, but we do. And it's the same thing with this world we live in. The world doesn't care about you, but God does. And He keeps you safe so that you can play. 
so that you can experience joy. And Jesus prays that this would happen to us so that our joy may be complete. Regardless of what's happening there, the sea was actually quite rough. There was a sardine run as well. Really strong backwash and side current there on that specific day. But they don't care. Because their dad looked out for them. And their dad put them in the place where, where, the, where they were supposed to be and where they could play with joy. You and I have an enemy. And we are protected. Both at the same time. And we need to hold that truth. If they went uh, astray, they would have been in big trouble. But they didn't. So they're still alive today. I praise Jesus for His grace. It's the same for us. You will be led astray if you don't pray for protection. And if you don't listen to the voice of the Father that says, stay close here, this is where you'll be protected and where you can have as much fun as you want. Why should we pray for this? Because the enemy is coming for this. And what is he coming for? Let's just look at the first two parts of the sermon. He comes for our identity. And he comes for our joy. Those are two of his biggest targets. Make you believe that you have a lesser value than God says and takes away all the awesome that he gives to you every day and makes you negative and condescending about the world and your spouse and your kids and your job and then you're negative about everything. That's how the enemy operates. Can you imagine the father looking at you Saying, that is not the truth. Do not go there. Come and play here where you are safe with me. Because if I saw them going down that little wall, I'll get up immediately. It's not like I'm going to sit back with Marie and go, yeah, 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 no, let them fall, let them swallow a little seawater, and then they'll come running back to us. That's not how I roll. And I'm an imperfect, very sinful, very young, inexperienced father. But I know how to keep them safe. And that's what God does for us. And Jesus says, pray for it so that you don't doubt and that you don't question when hard times come upon you and when, that you don't lose perspective of the good news and of God's love for us. It's so important. And why do we need to pray for protection? Because we have a job to do here. Because Jesus left us and gave us His Spirit while He went away so that we can finish the job that He started. And that's the next part of the prayer. So that was the second point. A prayer for protection. Third point. And I'll end off with this. A prayer for sanctification. Big church word. Here's what it means. To clean up and to put to one side for special use. Okay? So when we talk about sanctification, we are talking about being sanctified from something and then being sanctified for something. Think casserole. I have to clean out the mince and the fatty good stuff of yesterday. And then I'm putting it aside, but then I'm not leaving it. I'm making something new in it. Do you guys understand? So we are sanctified from something and we are sanctified for something. Now as Christians, what we are sanctified from is from sin. That needs to get out. We need to be cleaned out of our sin. And what we are sanctified for is for mission. We've got a job to do here. We're not just being cleaned up and put aside to look pretty. We are cleaned up and put aside to be used and to serve. In what? In God's mission for us. Look at the last two verses. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So the mission of Jesus was different. Only one guy could, uh, could die for the sins of the whole world, right? And that, that was the Messiah sent by God himself. We know him as his son, Jesus Christ. So in that sense, the mission of Jesus is different than ours. Our mission is to witness, to tell the story. Our mission is to testify. Our mission is to share with people that God loves them and that they carry great value. Our mission is to proclaim, right? To herald, to make it known that God wants to be in relationship with people. 
Our mission is to show this through tangible acts of love. Our mission is to love God and to love our neighbor. Our mission is to make disciples. So we sanctified from sin, we sanctified for mission, and the reason why sanctification is important is because all of these things that I've just mentioned that we are supposed to do takes a massive blow if we are trapped in sin. If we behave like the world, it takes away the credibility of our witness. You really need to hear this this morning. This is probably the thing that God placed on my heart the most this week. Think of all the isms and phobias that we struggle with. You cannot say something derogatory about a fellow human being and then say that God loves all people. There's no credibility to your witness. So you have to get rid of this sin. Because you can't say with the same mouth that, God, that I don't love specific people, but God loves all people. Anyone hearing that message will be confused. I come from the Dutch Reformed Church. That's why our history is so troublesome. Because we preach the gospel, but we didn't show it through our policies back in the day. That's why we have a distinctive like transculturality. We want people to see and feel what we preach. You cannot say something derogatory about someone acting like the world. I don't care if the world does it. Their hearts have not been captured and sanctified. But we can't do it and then say in that same mouth that Jesus loves everyone. You can't be drinking and cussing like everyone else and then talk about being obedient to Jesus. It just can't happen. Because where's the credibility? Oh, okay, I see. So you say that we have to be obedient to Jesus, but just sometimes. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. No, I'm talking about serious discipleship here. I'm talking about always being obedient. Okay, but you aren't always obedient. So how does that work? That's why we need to be sanctified. We need to be sanctified from stuff like coveting and greed. Because we can't talk about coveting and greed and wanting and then in the same mouth talk about generosity and giving and helping others. You can't do it. So if coveting or greed is a sin that you struggle with, you need to be sanctified from it. Because if you want to test the Bible about the good news of Jesus, that will hamper it. Being negative and complaining about everything, then trying to testify about joy and freedom. How confusing is that? You're the most negative person I know, but you are telling me that Jesus will give me the same joy you have. And you're telling me about freedom to live as a child, but you keep on complaining about everything. Like, what, what do you want me to hear? Can you guys see the mixed messages we have? That's why we are sanctified from sin, sanctified for mission. Being judgmental about people and then talking about grace for everyone. How confusing is that? He is, she is, they are, but God doesn't mind any of those things. He will give grace to all. It's really interesting. I don't see that grace flowing through your life. That's why sanctification is part of our mission. Jesus prays that we should be sanctified. And we should pray for it too. So we are praying for each other because we're valuable. We are praying that we would be protected. We should be praying that we will become more and more holy. Look more and more like Jesus. Take on His character. And we should encourage one another to deal with sin in a way that it doesn't take away our credibility of our witness. But that our word and our works or our walk and our talk would be the same. Because in that way, we will be able to spread the good news and to finish the mission that we were sent on. Let me show you a picture. It's a really lame picture, but it's a great picture. I believe as much as we struggle with prayerlessness at this moment, we also struggle with wordlessness. And that's a true story. Because this is God's word. And Jesus says, they will be sanctified by the truth, and your word is the truth. 
This is the perspective on life and on everything in it that will never change. And not only is it never changing, it is always life-giving. Have you ever read the Bible and not felt life coming back to you? That's the way that it should be. But for some reason, we do not read it. And if you don't read it, how will you know? And I want you to just take an honest look at your own life. Everyone can't read, uh, everyone can't read t- 10 chapters a day, but you can do 10 verses. And if you can't do 10, you can do one. I mean, we saw an example of Genesis 50, 20 being imprinted on her heart earlier this morning. Just through repetition and through saying it again and saying it again and saying it again. I don't think that we read our Bibles, and I'm honest with you. And if you don't read your Bible, you'll always be found wanting on the truth. And if you don't read your Bible and you found wanting on the truth, you will be found wanting in your sanctification. Because the one thing that the Bible will do every single day is it will convict you of your own sin, and it will confirm God's grace and forgiveness to you. Reading the Bible is a beautiful thing. For some reason, we make excuses that some parts of the Bible are difficult. Of course it's difficult. It's a brilliant book written over thousands of years with a huge message. Watching Lord of the Rings is also difficult. You have to follow the characters and the plot line. Watching a series is also difficult because you can't fall asleep. So reading the Bible is difficult, but it's awesome. And we have to do it. And I just want to exhort you this morning or admonish you or encourage you to just give it a shot. Make time, sit down and read it. A couple of weeks ago, someone in our city group said to me, Dude, I read Hebrews this morning. And after I read Hebrews, I closed my Bible and I said, Holy Spirit, I've got absolutely no idea what I just read. I don't know who Melchizedek is. I don't know what a priestly order is. But speak to me. I'm keen to listen. And I'm like, dude, you are in the right place. And let's talk about Melchizedek, right? Because I think he's a really fascinating character. But that's our posture. That should be our posture. It's still to ask the Spirit to help us interpret what He gave us. There's so many ways in which we can read our Bibles. And if you can't read that well, you can play it and you can listen to it on audio. We literally have no excuse to not consume the Word in massive chunks. The only excuse we have is everything else that distracts us. Do you guys remember in the war of the early 2000s, George Bush used to say, weapons of mass destruction. We live in a time now of weapons of mass distraction. We do. It's right, yeah. You need to put this baby aside. Have to, because it's going to distract you. Way too many things to look at here when we open up the Word. But we should give it a shot. We should give it a shot. That's us for today. So we spoke about the reason for Jesus' prayer. We spoke about a prayer for protection. And we spoke about a prayer for sanctification. And I would like us to spend some time here before we close in a response song. So somebody, you are welcome to take your place behind the keys. And I want you to just think through those three points. Am I gold? Do I think of myself as gold? Because you are even more valuable than gold. Infinitely more. When you carry God's image. Do you believe that? Is that something that you need to sit with this morning? If I, if I was able to hold a mirror up for you, will you be able to look at yourself in the mirror and look into your own eyes and then look really, really, really deep and see your own value and then thank God for it? Or do you believe that you are of lesser value because of some sort of lie that you believe? Just sit with it. If that's you, then you can tune out now because that's where the Holy Spirit wants you this morning. Think about Jesus' prayer for us for protection. Our kids squatted down next to that tidal pool because they trusted us that we'll grab them if something goes wrong. Do you trust God that He protects you? Because you can pray for it and you still can't believe it. Do you trust that He will protect you and that He'll keep you safe? And that he'll keep you guarded from the attacks of the enemy so that you can experience joy. Is joy lacking in your life?
Because if it is, then ask the Holy Spirit in this time to show that to you. And then say to him that I'm trusting you for my protection so that your joy might be in me. Or maybe your spot this morning is in the sanctification space. Maybe you need to repent. If you need to repent, do it now. Sit in that moment and say, Lord Jesus, I have missed the mark. I completely flipped my lid this morning with my wife and the kids. I said stuff to them that does not show God's character at all. And I would like to say sorry, and I would like to turn from it. I don't want to be like that. I want to be like you, full of grace and mercy and compassion. Bring stuff into the light in this moment. If you're not going to do it here, while the Spirit is working with you, when will you do it? We can't just let that moment pass. So somebody, you can create some time for us, and when you feel we're ready, then lead us in a song of response.